Good afternoon, everyone. So look, this is exciting and scary, right, at the same time. Because we made an assumption, all right, before coming here, we assumed that we wouldn't have even that many people here because of the, you know, not because of the ticket prices, probably, but because of the fact we are speaking during the, you know, afternoon tea time, just before the final act, right? So we made an assumption, and it was wrong. But we all make assumptions, right? For instance, when I walk up to the stage, and I switch my microphone on, you probably assume that's a microphone, which is not, it's a hair trimmer. <laughs> you see, we all make assumptions. So today, we're gonna talk about assumptions, facts, and other things, if my laptop allows. Okay, for a reason, yeah, I think it's getting there. <laughs> nice one. So, fantastic facts and uh, how to use them, right? So uh, you might have made the connection to the famous movie, Fantastic Beasts and White Fina, and we deliberately chose that one because there's a character in this movie called Newt Scamander. He's a magizoologist, magic and zoology, and he's kind of relatable, we thought, with our audience because he's always trying to find the truth, looking uh, for facts. He doesn't seek popularity or fame, right? So uh, he might be really relatable, we thought. And also, these fantastic beasts, they are very difficult to find, catch, and they're expensive, just like facts. So straight away, we're gonna start with a question, all right? What's the main benefit of evidence in your daily work life? Okay, if you have any strong opinion, feel free to share. You can just raise your hand. Go on, maybe. Yeah. Um, it can uh, like prevent arguments, because you're talking about mm -hmm. something that's objective. Mm. Great. Instead of opinions, you can say, well, here's the evidence. Thanks for sharing. Nice. Uh, along the same lines, am I doing it right? How can I improve? Nice one. Thanks for sharing. Thanks a lot. We're not going to spend so much time on that. Uh, and we can approach that from different perspectives, right? And it depends on the scale we are looking at it as well. However, at the end of the day, for us, we believe it comes down to one specific tactical benefit on a uh, daily basis. Making fewer assumptions. Okay, this is the most important benefit. So how does it work, right? Uh, let's assume you are using Scrum Framework, right? You generate evidence uh, in the form of customer feedback, right? And hopefully you are going to use that feedback uh, for your planning process and you are going to have a product backlog with fewer assumptions and better hypotheses. And ideally it will result in better customer outcomes followed by better business outcomes, but that's very circumstantial, okay? It may not happen uh, due to external factors, so we are not going to spend so much time on that, but we're gonna focus on the fewer assumptions. So in theory, this is how you may expect to see that, but please do not take it too literally, it's just a graph to convey the message, right? It's not a formula. Uh, so as you increase the number of facts in your system, you are getting closer to the, uh, sorry, the evidence in your system. You are getting closer to the facts. And when you have more facts in your system, uh, you may expect to decrease the number of assumptions. But is it even possible to generate that many facts to decrease the number of assumptions to zero? Probably not. It's not economical or feasible, especially if you're in a competitive market. Uh, or if you are dealing with, a, with an infectious disease that you need to act very quickly, you just need to generate enough, sufficient amount of um, facts so you can act, inspect, and adapt. You know how it goes. Uh, the bottom line is we should generate evidence as quick as possible to make fewer assumptions and generate uh, more, uh, better hypotheses. But we'll still make some assumptions in the process. So far, so good. No, 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 I'm not having that. Um, I, th I think, Shahin, we made a mistake somewhere in this slide because I think what happened here is we ourselves made a huge assumption. And that assumption is that within your organisations, all that data you're driving, all those objective truths are more important than the political beasts that are out there in your world. All right, so let's break it down. This is what science looks like, or 
<laughs> this is a person <laughs> who's very, very strong. Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, eminent astrophysicist, looks at three categories of truths. And he talks about there being a uh, an objective truth. So in our world of agility, we talk about empiricism, we talk about science, scientific facts, right? Personal truths. So this might be something very, very centered to you. It might be a religion, a faith, just the way you see the world, but no one can take it away from you. And political truths. So any members of the Tory party will know that there's convenient explanations out there. Um, all right, <laughs> talking about politics. This, this, this is a bit more concise. So objective truths are established by evidence, okay? Personal truths by faith, and then political truths by incessant repetition. And let's take a dig deep, uh, sorry, a deep dive, literally, in the Arctic, the Alaskan Arctic, with Mama Bear. Can everyone wave hi to Mama Bear? Yay, I like it. That worked out better than I thought it was going to work. Um, so Mama Bear, Alaskan Arctic, she looks after two beautiful little polar bear cubs and her partner, and she's the main fish winner in her family. Okay? So what happens in Mama Bear's life when objective truth and political truth have a conflict? So Mama Bear knows that because of the global crisis uh, around climate change, by 2100, there's a good chance that there will be no more polar bears in the world. Oh, okay. But Mama Bear knows that if she needs to send her cubs to private school, she needs to build that bigger den, and she needs to get that bigger sled to take them around in, she may have to go and work for the drilling company, <laughs> who are also co-located in the Alaskan Arctic. So Mama Bear might make a decision that puts the political truth for her, which is her local concerns, way above the long term. So, as her friend might say in the environment, always assume that people have good intentions, but also assume they have to pay for their mortgages, cars and kids' education. And that clouds a lot of decision making and how we process data. So, the other thing to remember, <laughs> in summary, we want you to take is all truths are equal, but some truths are more equal than others. So let's take a look at objective data once more. Yay! So, quite a segue, I know, but bear with us, we're gonna connect. So how long is the coastline of Great Britain? That's the question, and we're gonna give you a few options, three options, to be more precise. A, 2,350 kilometers. B, 2,775 kilometers. Thank you. C, 3,425 kilometers, all right? Who says A? You can just raise your hand. Don't Google, it's just, yeah, make a guess. Who says B? Who says C? Wow, C, okay. So, congratulations, you all are correct. All options are correct. How does it happen? Oh, nice. You know what, that's, that's a real study regarding self-similarity and fractal patterns. So if you measure that with 200 kilometer sticks, it's option A. If you measure that with 100 kilometer sticks, it's option B. If you measure that with 50 kilometer sticks, it's option C, and the deviation between A and C is like 40%. And these all are objective truths. All right. Uh, the reason behind, I'm not going to spend so much time on that, but just to give the context, you can Google it later. Koch curve, it's a fractal pattern, and coastlines are fractal patterns. And when you uh, think about fractal pattern, it's something like a snowflake. Uh, at any scale, it will look the same, and you try to be more precise, you, the length will get longer. Okay, so you are just over-engineering after some point. But it's not the question. All right, why are, am I just telling that to you randomly, right? What to make of it? What we know, first, the result changes according to the tool and method we use. But these all are objective truths. Second thing, this is a physical presence and it's 2022 and we cannot approximate it precisely. It must be kind of uncomfortable. And finally, we don't even need to. If we start with the intention, what we try to achieve, right? What, what is the goal? What's the direction? Whatever we call it, right? If you start with that, 
For instance, we know uh, we can time our travel around the British coast. So that's enough direction to understand why we do these things. Uh, so if you start with the intention, it will help us to cut so much noise and waste. And it doesn't end here, right? The conflict between objective truths and political truths and how objective truths can be manipulated, uh, it goes into the heart of the evidence. If you were feeling uncomfortable already, <laughs> this is going to get worse. <laughs> So this is a meta-science study. Most published research findings in the field of psychology are false. And this might be something to do with it. So who, who here's heard of replication crisis? Ah, OK. Would someone like to volunteer just to kind of quickly spin up? What's the replication crisis, sir? Ah, yes, so it, it links, it links, that's right. So the whole point with something being replicable is that you're able to rep reproduce your results independently. So agnostic of the context, you're supposed to be able to lift this thing over here and you're supposed to observe similar results. So let's take a look at what's happening in a sub-branch sub of science, psychology. Replication rates by journal, only 48% of replication takes place in the Journal of Experimental Psychology. 38% for psychological science. 23%. 23% in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. All right, it's difficult now, but here it gets weirder. So we've got some learned colleagues who know about replication crisis. Has anyone heard of weird in science? No? Okay, weird science. Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic parts of the country, in which 95% of 174 peer review studies were conducted, basically dragged and dropped the findings in these places and then said, this is universal behavior for the rest of the world. So those of you familiar with best practice in your workplaces, it's kind of like that but for science, and it has like some interesting results. And going back to the gentleman um, who mentioned about the publication bias, just imagine, right, so you're a hardworking student, you've become a PhD, you're now a postdoc, and you want to get successful in the world of science. Now, you have to try and appease your professor, you're trying to provide some support to your PI, then your university, then your publica uh, publication has to go out into the wider scientific community. And if you report a positive result, it's more likely to get published, right? So we've got some real challenges. If, if it wasn't difficult enough establishing objective truth, there's also a political problem in science. Furthermore, we work off a linear statistical model traditionally. So science had a really good way of looking at parts and really, really like shrinking down to understand those parts. And the, and the lack of interdisciplinary collaboration was obvious. But we all know now it's the relationships in between these parts that are useful. Let's take an example of what that is, the brain. Okay, so under a light microscope, you look at the brain and you go, here are the neurons. Okay, I can see them and you can study them. But if we didn't understand the whole patterns of flow between them, like how this neural network was functioning, we wouldn't really understand how the brain works at all. And in your organization, Formed out of people, the network could be similar to neurons. And if you observed individuals and teams and you started to do some health checks or metric checks of these people, not necessarily sure you're going to get, again, some more information around how that system flows or functions. Although it might make a good promotion at the time. So, yeah, especially for the last topic uh, we mentioned, if you really want to understand complex system science that's directly uh, investigating those topics, uh, we will suggest that you go to the proper scientists first. And a New England Complex uh, Systems Institute founded by Yanir Baryam, an MIT professor, uh, who's been uh, working on real-life problems such as eradicating Ebola disease, uh, 
in Africa and mitigating ethnic violence in Europe and still fighting against COVID in a project uh, which we are also supporting with Nitin. Uh, we strongly suggest that you have a look. Okay, so, so what? We don't want to turn into this guy, right? So moaning, moaning, moaning. So, so what? So if you face an environment, a complex environment in which uh, political truths and objective truths are conflicting, uh, if, and if you ask us what would be the ultimate question, if you say this, 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 we will be lying, all right? We don't know exactly what the answer is. But we can share a few things that worked for us in the past. Uh, we don't try to convince you, but if you find any value, if you want to join the discussion, we are about, we are always ready, all right? So first thing that we kind of suggest, kill your darlings. If you're into creative writing, you may, heard about, you may have heard about it, right? So basically, it's about being detached from the things you feel connected, you hold dear. It might be a school of thought. It might be um, a guru, an expert, a framework, anything, right? But you just need to let it go. Uh, do not, do not, you know, depend on case studies and research so much uh, before you question their assumptions very hard. And in our cases, we saw that many of these case studies, uh, they won't work in your own environment. They are making so many assumptions. Mm. We do not say they are uh, worthless, of course. They are, there are so many helpful case studies, but question them very hard and their assumptions very hard. Think for yourself, cross-check with your own reality. And keep that in mind, we are tribal animals. And there's an uh, evolutionary process behind that, which means when we see something, our first response is not to say, oh, what's the fact, what's the evidence? No, we are asking, if, even before we are aware of that, we ask that, would my tribe approve this idea? If I like this idea, would my tribe be upset or happy? Even being aware of that situation, we believe it's helpful to create some uh, enabling constraints for yourselves. And unlearning, ability to unlearn. It's like time to market, right, for an organization, uh, or uh, time to pivot. How fast can you detach from an idea when you see the facts and evidences and try something new? This is one of the most important uh, capabilities you can build, uh, we believe. And talking about capabilities, a superpower is to reveal the constraint. We've been a bit hyperbolic there. <laughs> there might be a number of constraints in your organization. But what we're talking about here is don't really go for the low-hanging truths that get you personal credit and you know, gives you something to work off. But try and figure out what's happening with regards to political and personal truths in your organization. So when you're in these rooms, sometimes boardrooms, figure out where is the data being utilized? Who is it being utilized by? Right? What's not being published? sometimes quite telling who also on a personal level <laughs> who are you starting to get drawn into it's like is there someone who's very personality driven where you're warming up to them or someone you're scared of in that organization what are you feeling when you go in because these things will start telling you it will be in a very different way like what the lie of the land is and the point with this is that we actually worked in an organization where we had been collectively trying to effectively help and support the organization. We'd taken lots of data, lots of care about how we'd created the data. We collaborated with teams and we were finding that our data was either getting lost or it was being weaponized. And we really wanted to understand what was it that was holding things back. So kind of this guy <laughs> plucked up the courage to say, look, let's just get in a meeting with chief products owner to figure out why this person was a little bit uncomfortable with some of the data we're providing. So this is it. This is a simple question we asked. <laughs> so the data is not being used. Why is that? Why is there a problem? We asked, can you coexist with the CTO? How many words do you think the CPO used? Whoops, <laughs> it didn't work too well. No, one word. So. Through one conversation, one direct conversation, we got to the heart of the political truth, which is CPO and CTO have a massive, massive discrepancy. So it didn't matter in the middle of this like rapidly scaling um, fintech with lots of growing pains, um, a massive shared objective, massive market capitalization. 
none of that was important. It was, these guys couldn't get on and we have to work from that point onwards. Happy to talk about this one in greater detail due to client confidentiality later. So what does this lead us on to, Shahin? Yeah. Right. As you read, right, stop looking for leaders now and start looking for teammates. And it has a direct uh, relationship with hierarchy, hierarchical uh, structures and uh, the constraints the hierarchy can create under uh, certain circumstances. And there's a reason behind that scientifically. Human beings are the only species that can generate more collective complex behaviors than they can do individually. All right, to give an example, uh, think about the sheep and think about the sheep flock. Which one is more complex? Sheep is kind of more complex, the individual sheep, uh, because a sheep flock has very well defined behaviors at scale. It can go right, left, forward, it's easier. And it applies to all animals in nature, do you know that? Apart from one species, which is human beings. Human beings can uh, collectively create more complexity when they get together. And the reason behind that, according to some theories, is uh, the evolution of language. All right. And that's why we can just build Hubble Space Telescope, not sheep flocks, right? And the uh, takeaway from this little bit, uh, which is complex that can be generated by a single individual, it has a limit. And we can calculate that, literally. Uh, I'm not going to distract you by giving uh, something about that, but we are going to share some resources around that. But when people can get together, the complexity they can generate, the response they can generate, it goes, you know, almost unlimited. This is an important information to keep in mind. And the second thing is that you may have heard about uh, Ashby's law. Basically, it's always a balance between sy systems complexity and environment complexity. When I say it like that, it feels like an episode of Love, Death and Robot, I realize, but let's use an uh, example. So, uh, in military organizations, for instance, uh, the environment is ocean, you have naval ships, uh, they don't have so much flexibility, the environment is relatively less complex. And if you want to save a hostage from a mansion, things change. It's a very complex environment, so you need to have a system structure to answer to respond to this complexity, then you go with special forces, not with tank division or infantry, right? So this is always a balance between systems complexity and environment complexity. Keep that in mind as well, please. And when you think about these two things, what could go wrong possibly in this picture, do you think? People, this is a bandwidth system. We are intentionally constraining our organization's capability to respond to change to a controller or a group of controllers. So these people at the bottom, they need to talk to each other. It should look like a network to generate more complexity. But when you uh, use the structure in a volatile market, I'm not generalizing to everything if the environment is complex, right? Uh, we are constraining our organization's capabilities to respond to change, okay? And in certain environments, basically, hierarchy can function as a great recipe to create stupid organizations consistent of smart people. At least this is our experience, okay? And final thing, sorry. Even if you can remove one layer in this picture, right? That's a win. To uh, mitigate the conflict between the political and objective truths, right? Great. And here's another thing we've learned. Clarifying the goal before measuring is very, very useful. <laughs> So again, in our world, um, with all the associated measurement and metric that happens, I think sometimes we start with measurements. And fundamentally, that means that people are prone to like, make an assumption about what's happening with regards to their own personal circumstance. So if you're about to be measured, we know in science that you will alter your behavior, right? Now, what does that mean? So just say, 
relate that to your work, and you see this relationship. So if we were to dive straight to measures without considering our goals, that's when our behaviours change, and that's where people are actually working relatively blindly, making assumptions about those high-level goals. So this cycle should operate slightly differently, <laughs> in which we believe it's useful to set those goals first, then drive some measures, and then find out how the behaviours are flowing. And again, uh, we, we, we kind of extend that and like the framework of uh, EBM, which we find useful. But let's do this, right? We're getting to the end. I know people are starting to kind of wane a bit. But say I was confronted on stage and someone said, I've got to make a guess. There's two teams. They're playing football or soccer in the USA. Which team won and by how much, right? I would probably bet my life it's team A. Team A. It's got to be team A, right? Look at that. Shots, shots on target, all those things. But this is the real life result between Juve and Villarreal in the Champions League a while ago, okay? Now, what does this teach us? So we know business is not a zero-sum game. It's not always easy to make those parallels, but this is somewhat like a football game in so much as our main goal is to win. That tends to happen by scoring goals. I don't know if there's any other circumstance that's ever happened, apart from scoring more goals than someone else. But if you show more effort, it's not going to guarantee it. If you're going to take more shots, it's not going to guarantee the result. If you get better players and you sign them up or they get three million, <laughs> as we've seen recently, it's not going to guarantee the result. And, you know, your kit sponsors or marginal gains on your shorts won't guarantee it. But this is the point. You can't ignore these capabilities, right? You want to succeed. You still have to do these things. But just think about that unpredictability in the environment. Dora metrics. Now, we found this useful, and we found this useful as an example as well. Dora metrics are incredibly valuable, very, very useful in terms of being able to set us up for some success in software delivery. But both of us were joint working with a client where <laughs> they managed to deliver the wrong things 10 times faster, which actually led to the closure of company. Right? So that product line was closed, that business entity was closed. That's real. And I think if you want to take away an example of something that's, uh, that's quite painful, you don't want to experience, it might be you know, the false sense of certainty and control that gets imposed when you look at those measurements. So what else can we do? Yeah, fi ourselves? final bit, yeah. So change teams, jobs, and sectors is self-descriptive, right? And there's a reason uh, behind that as well. It helps you become more creative and generate more responses uh, under uncertain conditions. And how, wh why does it happen? Why does it happen from a scientific perspective? Our brain works in sub-networks, all right? For instance, our vision, when we see an object, like programming language, right? We create classes, functions, and attributes, this type of stuff. Uh, we categorize these things into tables like shape, color, motion. Then we cross-match these things to create redundancy. All right, what does it mean? Uh, we see a bird flying. We know human beings. We haven't seen a human you know, flying, but we can imagine a human that flies. Because we can cross-match these functions and classes. And it gives redundancy. Redundancy gives creativity. And it gives us more uh, innovation space. That's how we get planes, right? And how does it translate in our uh, work life? Basically, uh, when you change your environment frequently, this is something we do uh, all the time. And uh, it helps you to, see, to be exposed to more experiences people's ideas, right? So it will help you to uh, become better uh, in terms of responding to change and seeing the nuances in different environments. We believe it's very important, yeah. So finally, maybe it's not a math problem. <laughs> Sorry, but that's terrible. <laughs> Let me try again. Maybe it's not a math, no. Um, <laughs> maybe it's not a math problem, mathematics. But it is always, in our opinion, a science problem, OK? And we do believe that there's a future out there in which we don't know the answers today, but we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll find out a lot more by learning together and admitting when we don't know.
and be able to buttress what we do know, right, in the future, if we approach things the right way. The second thing we believe is if we start resolving these political truths, objective facts, we examine the interplay and we look at how re in real life it operates, it will help us really get under finding what's real, right? And the third thing we believe is as people, if we can really galvanize ourselves to be brave enough to do, do those two things, we've got a chance of elevation. We've got a chance of elevating our thought levels, right? Why should we be playing the local concern games when we can achieve much more together, solve some of the world's hardest problems? So just one thing we'd offer is a massive thank you for listening. <laughs> Thanks for taking in what we've done today. Um, and also, send us a message if you feel like this is something that you're uh, you know, you relate to, you connect to, we're about. Um, and more than that, again, here's some references for you. <laughs> Just so you can pick apart our science, because we, like we like to keep honest. Um, and yeah, again, thank you very much for your time. Unfortunately, we don't have more time for questions, but we're about, yeah? Well, thank you.